Hello, I'm Jane Morris and in this presentation I'll cover the risk assessment of genetically modified insect resistant cotton, known as BT cotton, for general release and cultivation in southern African countries. In this presentation I'm not going to talk about what BT is and how it works, but if you would like more information on this you should have a look at my presentations on BT maize particularly the one on BT maize for food and feed use. In that video, I give much more background on BT toxins in general. We'll briefly cover, firstly, what different types of BT cotton are already grown around the world and also in Southern Africa, and how do we go about assessing the risks for human health and the environment. We will then go through the full risk assessment for two particular BT cotton events as examples. Many different types of BT cotton are cultivated around the world in at least 15 countries. The global area of GM cotton in general is around 25 million hectares, which represents about 80% of the total cotton grown. In fact, more countries have adopted GM cotton than any other GM crop mainly because the primary use is for fibre rather than for food or feed, so its introduction has been less controversial. Having said that, however, in fact, although the main use is for cotton fibre for textiles, cottonseed oil is in fact used in many processed foods such as mayonnaise and potato chips. Cottonseed cake or meal, the residue after the oil has been extracted, as well as the hulls, are used in animal feeds. And then there are also some peripheral uses as a fertiliser, or, in the case of the oil, in some cosmetics. There are at least 11 unique transformation events that have been approved in various countries. In some cases, these contain genes for other traits, or even genes other than BT for protection against insect attack. And many of these events are also available in stacks with other traits through conventional crossing. The BT genes in approved events include CRY1AB, CRY1AC, CRY2AC and CRY1F. So how important is cotton in Southern Africa? Well, the biggest producers in the world are China, India, Brazil and the United States. But nevertheless, Quite a number of countries in the Southern African region do grow some cotton. These include Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, Tanzania, Botswana, Mozambique and South Africa. South Africa is the only country in the region growing GM cotton, though the cotton crop represents a small area of planting, around 8,000 hectares. So why should we be interested in growing BT cotton in Southern Africa? Well, there are a number of Lepidopteran pests that infest the cotton crop and that can be controlled by BT. The main one is the cotton bollworm, but there is also the red bollworm, two species of spiny bollworm and the pink bollworm. These can all cause major damage to the crop, sometimes leading to losses as high as 60%. Just to give you an idea of what they can do, this photo shows a cotton bollworm boring its way right into the base of a cotton flower. Two BT cotton events have been approved for use in South Africa, both produced by Monsanto. Mon 531, known as Bolgard, was approved very early on in 19097, while Mon 15985, known as Bolgard 2, was approved in 2003. Both contain the BT Cry1AC gene but MON15985 additionally contains the BT CRY2AB2 gene which binds to different receptors in the insect midgut and this should help to prevent the development of resistance to BT. Both of these events are also available as stacks with tolerance to the herbicide glyphosate known as Roundup Ready. If you would like to know more about herbicide tolerant crops Take a look at my presentations on herbicide-tolerant GM maize. In this presentation, I'm going to take you through the risk assessment for both MON531 and MON15985. 
starting with MON531. It contains three inserted genes. Firstly, the BT Cryo1AC gene, but then also the NPT2 gene coding for resistance to the antibiotic neomycin or canamycin, and then a third gene coding for the resistance to the antibiotic streptomycin. However, this last gene is on a bacterial promoter and it's not expressed in the plant. MON15985 was created through a second transformation event on top of MON531. So, it contains the same genes as MON531, but additionally the CRY2AB2 gene and also a gene coding for a scorable colour marker. MON531 was created through agrobacterium transformation and it contains one copy of the CRY1AC gene modified for expression in plants, as well as an inactive 3' portion of the same gene inserted head to tail at a single locus. Single copies of the NPT2 and AAD genes are also present. The event was shown to be stable over eight years of field testing in the States. Expression levels were variable, up to 9 micrograms per gram fresh weight for CRY1AC and 15 micrograms per gram fresh weight for NPT2. MON15985 was subsequently created by biolistic transformation of MON531. There is a single copy of a synthetic CRY2AB2 gene with transcriptional activation modulated by a 5' untranslated sequence from a petunia heat shock protein. The sequence coding for a chloroplast transit peptide is fused to the gene to direct the expressed protein to the chloroplasts. The reason for this is that it leads to much higher levels of expression due to the presence of multiple chloroplasts in a cell. The UIDA gene codes for beta-glucuronidase, or GUS, included as a scorable marker, and both genes are inserted as single copies at a single site. CRY2AB2 levels were up to 43 micrograms per gram fresh weight, and GUS was up to 106 micrograms per gram fresh weight, so the expression levels are considerably higher than the expression levels in MON531. We look first at the food and feed safety issues for MON531. CRY1AC is a Bt protein with a history of safe use and is also found in several Bt maize varieties. It degrades rapidly in gastric fluid. Acute oral toxicity studies in mice showed no effect even at the highest dose levels. The NPT2 protein shows no homology to known protein toxins or allergens and also showed no effect in acute oral toxicity studies. Since the product of the AAD gene is not expressed, we don't need to be concerned about its safety. Cottonseed oil is used in human food products but it contains no detectable protein, and so in fact the gene products are not going to be present in human food. Compositional analysis of MON531 showed no difference from conventional cotton, including in levels of the anti-nutrient Gossipol. 28-day feeding studies with rats and dairy cows showed no adverse effects, and a feeding study using raw cotton seed fed to bobwhite quail also showed no adverse effects. Over the years, concerns have been expressed about the use of antibiotic resistance markers in GM crops, and more recent events no longer use such markers. The main concern has been the possible transfer to bacteria, either in the gut or in the soil. However, there is in fact no evidence of such transfer, and the consensus is that the risk is virtually zero. Even if transfer did occur, there would be no clinical significance. There are already low levels of naturally occurring resistance to neomycin in soil bacteria, and any transfer would not impact on this. Moving on to the food and feed safety of MON15985, we look at the additional gene products in that event. 
Like Cry 1AC, Cry 2 ABT, AB2 is also a Bt protein with a history of safe use. It's found in several Bt maize varieties. It degrades rapidly in gastric fluid. Acute oral toxicity studies in mice showed no effect even at the highest dose levels. The GUS protein shows no homology to known protein toxins or allergens and also showed no effect in acute oral toxicity studies with mice. Compositional analysis compared MON15985 with conventional cotton and with MON531 over a series of eight field trials. All variations were within the normal range for cotton. A 90-day feeding study with ground cotton seed in rats showed no adverse effects and also a 56-day feeding study with cotton meal in channel catfish also showed no adverse effects. No differences in agronomic performance between MON531, MON15985 and conventional cotton have been found in a series of field trials in the US and elsewhere except for the impact of the introduced traits. In practice, the actual performance of the Bt cotton is going to vary depending on management practices and climate. One recent concern for Bt cotton grown in Burkina Faso has been the shorter fibre length of the Bt cotton compared with their conventional cotton. This is an issue that needs to be dealt with through conventional breeding in order to ensure that the trait is integrated into local varieties without loss of the longer fibre length. In terms of environmental safety, the inserted genes are specific to Lepidoptera and therefore no effect is expected on other non-target organisms. However, to check this, tests were carried out on a range of indicator species of non-target invertebrates, including honeybees, the ladybird beetle, grain lacewings, earthworms and columbola. No adverse effects were seen for any of these organisms exposed to the Bt proteins at levels that exceed the maximum that might be found in cotton fields. The Bt genes are rapidly degraded in soil and so no effect is anticipated on soil organisms, but in any case, no effects on soil organisms have in fact been found. We next ask the question if there is potential for gene flow to wild relatives of cotton. Firstly, it's important to note that cotton is not a weedy crop and its pollen is very large, heavy and sticky, so it doesn't spread far. In fact, it's primarily self-pollinating, although there is some potential for cross-pollination from insects such as bees. There are some wild relatives of cotton in the region, but they are all diploid, whereas cultivated cotton is allotetraploid. As such, it's incompatible with the wild cotton species. Gene transfer to conventional, that is non-GM cotton, is possible. Recommended isolation distances for cotton breeders are 200 metres, so a separation between GM and conventional cotton of this distance should prevent significant outcrossing. This, of course, is not an issue of safety, but rather an issue of consumer rights to know, since gene transfer to non-GM cultivated cotton would not result in adverse effects to human health or the environment. Another concern for Bt crops is that the target Lepidopteran pests could develop resistance to Bt. As I said earlier, the inclusion of two Bt genes in MON15985 is one way to delay the onset of resistance. However, in addition, any release needs to be accompanied by a resistance management strategy and ongoing monitoring. The requirement for a non-BT refuge is generally standard and it's normally 20% for cotton, but the size of this could potentially be reduced in the case of MON15985 because of it carrying two BT genes. Compliance monitoring is essential and it's also essential to explain to farmers the importance of the refugia. These are all issues that I go into in a separate presentation on managing resistance to Bt. 
So overall, having gone through the risk assessment, we can state that no hazards were identified that would lead to significant harm to humans or the environment, and that the likelihood of any harm materialising can be considered negligible. The overall risk is therefore also negligible, and from this perspective, regulators could be confident that they could give approval to general release of 1531 and 15985 in the Southern African region. There is, however, one more aspect that might be considered, and that is the issue of socio-economic impacts. Every country decides, according to their legislation, whether they will take socio-economic impacts into consideration, and of course these may be either negative or positive. A lot has been written about the difficulties of carrying out socio-economic assessments, particularly ex-ante assessments, that is ahead of any approval. There's no clear methodology, and while many countries include socio-economic issues in their legislation, few have a clear idea as to how to go about it. However, now that BT cotton has been introduced in many countries, including South Africa, there is a growing body of ex-post data concerning socio-economic impacts. Globally, and also in South Africa, the introduction of BT cotton has had an overall positive effect based on ex-post assessments. The benefits are clear in terms of increased farm income, higher yields and decreased use of pesticides. However, in South Africa, the cotton crop as a whole, and particularly for small-scale farmers, has been negatively impacted by closure of cotton gins, unavailability of credit and low cotton prices. These are factors that are outside the ambit of a risk assessment for BT cotton. So, we can reach the final conclusion that MON 531 and MON 15985 can be safely cultivated in Southern Africa. Note, however, that each BT event should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. However, the methodology that I've shown you here can be easily followed for other events. Thank you.